All right, I think we're all settled. Okay, um, well, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Scottish Parliament and to the Festival of Politics. And thanks for coming along uh, to this particular session where we're going to be covering navigating migration. Um, and it's a panel that has been organised in conjunction with the Scottish Parliament's cross party group um, on migration, which I am the convener of. Um, and we're going to discuss um, with our esteemed panellists the realities and difficulties and challenges um, of migrants, um, asylum seekers, refugees in Scotland uh, today, and particularly as they negotiate uh, their right to work, study and live in this country. Um, and we're going to do an hour of discussion, uh, and then a after an hour we're going to move on to a Q&A session. So hopefully we'll stimulate plenty of conversation and questions. Um, so if you can hold your thoughts till the end uh, in the last half an hour, then we'll uh, come to the room and we can open it up. Um, also, just to let you know that we are live streaming uh, today's session on Scottish Parliament TV. Um, so, just so you know, uh, so if there's anything particularly problematic that you would rather not rebroadcast or whatever, I don't know. Uh, just so you're aware. Uh, so, there we are. So, without further ado, um, I just want to introduce uh, our panellists. Um, we've got Graeme O'Neill. Uh, who is Policy Manager for the Scottish Refugee Council. Um, and we've also got Pinar Aksu, uh, uh, who is Human Rights and Advocacy Coordinator for the Mariela Integration Network in Glasgow. Uh, we've got Karen Goodwin, uh, who is an investigative journalist and co-editor of The Ferret, which is a cooperative collective of journalists working on some pretty in intensive investigative journalism in Scotland. Uh, and we've got Andy Cyril at the at far end there, uh, who is the co-founding partner and legal director of Just Right Scotland. Um, so like a pro bono um, legal uh, champions for, for people who otherwise wouldn't necessarily get the representation that they ought to get in this legal system. So yeah, um, we've got a lot to unpack today and we've got a very short period of time to do it. Uh, and I think we're just going to look at generally the landscape legislatively in the UK at the moment. Um, in the last year, we've seen pretty alarming developments in the asylum and migration landscape um, with the passing of legislation such as the Nationality and Borders Act and the Illegal Migration Act. So just really to open up um, the discussion in the context of the current legislation that's been passed, um, how can we mitigate the impact of these law changes on people seeking asylum in Scotland so I might want to start um, with, with Andy, if you might want to set the scene on that one. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I suppose the, the, the best place to start would be giving a wee brief summary of what the, the latest piece of legislation that just passed says. Um, so the Illegal Migration Act um, effectively ab abolishes uh, the asylum system in the UK for everybody who entered the country after the 20th of July, so just uh, a couple of weeks ago. It uh, expands uh, powers of detention in the UK. It mandates uh, removal from the UK without ever hearing of the stories that people have, have fled and, and uh, you know, the, the persecution they've experienced. Um, it targets victims of trafficking in the UK by stripping them of the support that they would ordinarily receive here uh, in Scotland through safe houses, uh, therapeutic support, legal support. Uh, and it also uh, gives the Home Office the power to remove children from Scottish local authority care into Home Office hotels so that they can be removed from the country as well. So the, the bill is, the act I should say, is really punishing. It, it's, it's changed the game, uh, so to speak. Um, as I said, it does in effect abolish the asylum system uh, for most that, that would use it here. So there's a, there's a lot of things, I think, that the Scottish Government that, that, and, and the Scottish Public Services and the people of Scotland can do to try and mitigate this. I think community opposition is where it starts, letting the, those in power know that that is not something that is aligned with our values and, uh, and our... <laughs> Fair enough. You can hold your thought till the end. Yeah, uh, we, we can open up that discussion. Thank you. Have a discussion about that for sure. Um, uh, I think that, that there are uh, the mitigations that can be put in place around the use, the use of detention facilities. Uh, there are mitigations that can be put in place around trying to continue to support victims of trafficking. 
uh, where, uh, where we can. I think there are mitigations around um, Scottish Government's ending destitution strategy because the bill is very likely to increase destitution and homelessness within Scotland. And uh, I think that the Scottish public authorities and statutory authorities need to uh, really carefully understand how they can continue to discharge their duties to protect children in, uh, and accompany children in, in Scotland as well. Uh, especially where we know that there's going to be evidence of um, exploitation, uh, neglect and harm uh, as a result. So there's a few different things that the Scottish Government uh, and Scottish public authorities can look at and we would encourage them to do so. Thanks very much for that. And Pinar, I just wondered if you could come in to offer a view of some of the people who are involved with the Mary Hill Integration Network and some of the practical implications some of these legislative changes would have on people on the ground in somewhere like Glasgow. Um, so I think one of the things that comes in with the Illegal Migration Act and also previously with the, with the policies that we had um, is since the pandemic, the fact that people have been accommodated at hotel accommodations throughout the country. Um, so I think that's going to increase in a level that um, rural communities are not going to be able to have the resources and the support mechanisms to provide the essential needs um, in terms of people, uh, supporting people. Um, the impact that we're going to see this um, and we are seeing is huge, especially on the impact on people's well-being and mental health. Um, so for those who doesn't know when somebody is seeking asylum, um, the, the process of receiving a positive or a negative decision could be a lengthy process. So some people could receive a decision within months, uh, but in our cases we have, uh, we have members who have been waiting in the process for years and years. Um, and that has a huge impact on people's well-being and mental health, and I think we're going to see much more increase on uh, on this and one of the reports that we worked with uh, in partnership with uh, Poverty Alliance was the impact of asylum process um, on people's well-being and uh, well-being and mental health while they are navigating the process. Um, so I think the impact on the local community is going to be huge, like I said, because of the lack of resources um, and some communities receiving people in a hotel accommodations where they are not aware of um, what does it mean to be an asylum seeker or all they're seeing is an hotel accommodation um, and they're just seeing that people are being accommodated there and they don't have the resources to provide the support um, the thing that in glasgow the look the lucky thing we we have is there are support mechanisms in place so organizations like ourselves like src and so many others across the city and um, we are able to provide that support um, but one thing that we are also facing at the moment is uncertainty. Uncertainty in terms of how this is going to impact um, on the people and also on the local community and at a wider society as well, the long implications of this, um, of the Illegal Migration Act and many others as well. So we are very uncertain of how that's going to look like and um, yeah, it's something that we are trying to navigate at the same time. Um, but in terms of for the people, like I said, it's, it's a huge, it's a very stressful process. Um, and we have, we had a recent discussion where we talked about the new act and people are unsure and unclear of what is happening. And I think that's been reflected um, within the policies and throughout when the Illegal Migration Act was being discussed, was uncertainty about how is this going to be impacted on people's life. Is it actually going to work? Is it not going to work? What is going to happen to people who are already in the asylum process, who has been waiting for such a long time? Um, is that issue around backlog going to be solved? How is that going to be solved? So there's a lot of uncertain questions um, and uncertainty within the sector, I would say. Well, thanks for that insight. And uh, Graeme, I just wondered if you could open up some of the issues around the, this backlog that Pinar mentioned, because uh, you know, we've seen an unprecedented number in the system uh, of people see seeking asylum and waiting for, for their sort of claims to be processed. Um, but 20 years ago, there was a similar spike in numbers, but we didn't see the same issues in terms of accommodation uh, pressures and so on. What's changed and, and what sort of areas can we actually practically affect in Scotland in regards to this issue of accommodation in particular? Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Paul. Um, and, and welcome everyone, it's really nice to be with you all. Uh, before I do that, and I will link around to that, is I just wanted to start with maybe 
putting a bit of context around what Andy started with, that here we are in the UK, uh, one of the states within the global north in the world, very rich state, lots of inequality issues, but actually quite a, quite a rich state. And as Andy said, we're, we've, what, three weeks, four weeks ago, we've abolished the right for people uh, from countries like Iran, Afghanistan, Syria, Sudan, Eritrea, all countries known for you know, systemic human rights abuses. Uh, we've actually abolished the right of people who are arriving maybe necessarily through clandestine routes, because there is no safe and legal route for people to come across to the UK territory and claim asylum. The UK government stubbornly refused to do that. Um, so those people now will not be able to claim refugee protection. Now, these, this is the, the Refugee Convention flowed out well, that's of... Good well, we can debate that, sir, in a second, um, and maybe later on in the questions. Would you please be quiet until the end? I don't appreciate heckling. Excuse me, sir, be quiet. I will tell you now, you, you will be quiet until the end. It's the chair's prerogative. Well, I'll tell you, sir, you will be quiet in this room until the end when you're invited to. That's the, pr the, the, pr the protocols which this parliament observes. We do not tolerate heckling in the chamber of the Scottish parliament amongst elected members. We certainly don't tolerate it amongst... Uh, well, you will, because I'm the chair. And if you aren't prepared to appreciate that, then you'll be invited to leave, OK? Yes? Well, if you don't mind, would you like to leave or would you be quiet? You've got, to, you've got a choice. Well, I'm afraid you don't have a choice in the matter, sir. You either be quiet and respect the people who have came here to listen to our speakers and the people who have been invited to come here, and you will listen respectfully, and then we will invite you to comment and issue, uh, issue a question. Do you... Yes, it is earned. It is earned by the, by the ballot box by people who are elected to represent this country. So what I'm saying to you now, sir, is you will be quiet and you'll respect the room and you will then be invited to a comment. I don't care whether you respect me or not, frankly. I think it's, I think it's probably time you've outstayed your welcome. It's about time you, you left, sir. Right, well, you'll now be es escorted from the premises, um, unfortunately. It's a great pity you have so much disrespect for everyone in the room who came here to listen to people... Yes, it is earned. Well, I tell you what, I, I tell you what, sir. If you want to earn respect, then I suggest you stand for election, and we'll, we will see. We will see. Uh, we'll see who uh, earns the respect of the people of this country at the ballot box. That's the nature of our democracy. And in our, our chamber, and in our chamber at the Scottish Parliament, we certainly don't tolerate heckling from a sedentary position. So, 
I mean, it's just to say that the UK state a few weeks ago has walked away from a life-saving international law, the Refugee Convention. Uh, you know, this is this is the legislation which flowed out of the international community's revulsion at the horrors of the Holocaust. It can hardly have more profound origins than it has. So I'm saying that to try and convey the gravity of what the UK state under the right, Conservative. Uh, I've, I've said to you, I've said to you, I will not tolerate interruptions in this proceeding. So yeah, it's a big deal, basically. Uh, <laughs> right. Great, next, next question. <laughs> and to okay. hopefully try and segue it into Paul's question, we've had over the last 10 years, especially in the last five years within the UK, a, a systemic devaluation of the person's right that comes to seek asylum in the UK to actually have that decision on their case in a, in a reasonable time frame. So what we've watched, you know, within the refugee sector is a ballooning of uh, people being held in limbo conditions. And we all know at a psychological level that uncertainty is often one of the most torturous experiences for people, not knowing what's going to happen. So you're not able to get your moorings psychologically into your future and start to plan. And what's been happening in the UK, when people talk about the decision, asylum decisions backlog, I think they need to centre our analysis on people's experiences and what that does to people in the human psyche and the ability to plan in their future. So a few years ago, about five years ago, the backlog was, I mean, I don't know the exact figures in one sense, it doesn't really matter, but you know, it was low tens of thousands, people waiting for an asylum decision for, uh, for six months or more. It's now people waiting for an asylum decision, about 170,000 people across the UK. Over 100,000 of them have been waiting six months or more. Many, a, a big portion of that have been waiting over a year. So that's a real waste of people who want to be able to have certainty in their lives and make decisions about their futures. And if the UK state, as it has just done, has walked away from the life-saving refugee convention, and that will cause immense suffering, as Andy and and Pinar have already articulated, then what, what it also will be doing is reflecting the political devaluation of the right to asylum within the UK. Uh, so the backlog is also a symbol of that political devaluation. They've just not invested practically in decision makers. They've not invested in the process and all the while people suffer. But it's not just about devaluation from our perspective at Scottish Refugee Council. We've also witnessed some very powerful vested interests within commercial companies. So you have Circle, you have G4S, you have Clear Springs Ready Home, you have the Mears Group, who are working to what the Home Office have put down as a commercial contract. And, and as commercial companies, they need to make a profit. They're under their obligation to try and make a profit. So what we've also witnessed is the asylum decision-making backlog is excellent business for these companies, as is having an accommodation centre regime, detention regime within legislation. That's also excellent business for these companies. So this isn't just a story of, kind of low politics, in our view, low racist politics 
often against people of colour within the asylum system. This is also a story of high-end profitability and commercial interests within these companies. And we should always remember that in other states in the world, including in the UK as well, commercial companies can have very subtly an imprint into what legislation is passed. And we don't think it's an accident, we certainly think it's worth interrogation, that one of the reasons we have an asylum decision-making backlog is that it's good business for the companies. Now, I'm not saying, to be clear, that they're perpetrating it, but what I am saying is that the companies may condone or may be happy with an asylum decision-making backlog, not the frontline workers within these companies, but perhaps some of the, bus the, the bosses within these companies, and maybe more specifically the institutional investors that put money into these companies, because they want to have a return for the money that they put in. I think that's a very interesting point, uh, Graeme. And, and Karen, you know, this kind of feeds into an, another issue, which is the, the public discourse and the framing uh, of often quite emotive debates, as we've already seen this morning. Uh, you know, it does, a, it does stimulate um, quite aggressive um, uh, discussion. Um, how do you feel the public discourse reflects some of these realities? Do you feel that it adds to public service? Do you feel that it uh, is covering for ulterior motives? How do you feel this public framing of issues like barges, uh, hotel accommodation often being described as saving the taxpayer money, etc.? Do you feel how this framing is working is, is effective? Sure. I think the framing is really interesting and very much at the heart of what has been considered as an asylum crisis. And I think a lot of these kind of moral panics start with an essential truth. And that essential truth is that there is an asylum crisis. And then you will, you will debate what that crisis might be. For a lot of people, that crisis is about human lives, is about people who are suffering at the very sharp end of, of systemic failures. But what it's being framed as by Conservative government and allies, of course, is a crisis in terms of the public purse, um, is, a, is a crisis in terms of stopping um, the, the flow of migration. And so you see a lot of really powerful forces come into this. Um, it's interesting to hear Graham just reflecting there on the kind of disaster capitalism that goes hand in hand. Um, with these type of moral panics. But you've got people who are making money in lots of ways in this, in this space. So you've got, you had people like Lee Anderson, for example, this week, the deputy chairman of the Tory party, who um, used what was described as salty language, which I wouldn't repeat, um, about um, people who were coming to, to the barge um, uh, and that they should go back to France, basically. Um, now, he is an interesting character. He's also paid um, £100,000 a year by GB News. Um, for his programme on that. He works for eight hours a week, which works out about £240 an hour. Um, so we've got um, people like him being very involved in the rhetoric. Um, we've also got um, interesting figures, special advisors for Suella Braverman. So um, people like the, the former editor of the Mail on Sunday are now advising Suella Braverman really good at capturing that public attention, punching through, you know, you'll see front pages on, on, the, on the Daily Mail and the, the Mail on Sunday. They'll be very much in support of the rhetoric that's being pumped out by the Conservative government. Um, you've got um, people like Katie Lambs, who was described previously when she was Boris Johnson's special advisor as um, Dominic Cummings' protege, is now also working um, for Suella Braverman in the Home Office. Um, so you've got this really interesting kind of like coalition of people who are really pushing out this rhetoric. And why this rhetoric matters is that the polling from the public doesn't tell them that, this is, that the public actually supports these policies. So in fact, the latest Ipsos poll, which was done fairly recently, just a couple of months ago, um, was showing that the majority of the UK, more than 50%, actually thought that, that they didn't support you know, stopping people from coming. And that you know, when you take, take people who were undecided, that leaves a small majority, uh, not a small majority, but a, a, a minority who, who would support these policies. You know, we were just reflecting before um, we came on that, you know, in a, in a recent question time, you know, in, in quite a, a conservative audience, um, most people did not support the Rwanda plan. So how do you get support for these type of plans and take attention away from the, the backlog? You really use framing and rhetoric and you really use this kind of language around um, moral panics, folk devils, and that, that kind of old school kind of, um, you know, we've seen it with the war on drugs, you know, prohibition, crackdowns, being tough on crime, and that will divert away from what 
we probably in this panel would argue is the real crisis is that people's lives are being um, treated as collateral damage. And so I think that's why it matters. Yeah. Thanks very much. I actually wanted to come, come to you, Andy, just, just before we move on. Where does it work well? Uh, so there's clearly a model here which is, is, has been described as perhaps cynically constructed um, to follow a political agenda, perhaps. But what models work well in terms of human dignity uh, and also work efficiently uh, elsewhere, say, in Europe? Uh, as, as there examples, perhaps, if, you know, if anyone in the panel has a view? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, the, the, uh, I'm going answer, to answer that in two sure. minutes, but I wanted to reflect on what Karen said there about public discourse and also reflect on the gentleman that has sadly uh, left us in this session. Um, because the public discourse speaks to um, th that gentleman, who I think is uh, potentially uh, scared. Okay? And, and the manifestation of his fear is anger. And he's scared because he's being told that um, the reason why there's a hotel in his community, for example, uh, is because everybody is coming here. And he doesn't know that the only reason there's a hotel in the community is because the Home Office have stopped making asylum decisions so that people are not being processed through to refugee status or not being processed through to you know, an appeal system and eventually you know, leaving the United Kingdom. So, so the result of that backlog is that the community accommodation filled up and then the hotels came and the hotels filled up and then the barges come. But he doesn't know that because he's not told about it. He doesn't know that um, the reason why the boats started coming is because all of the other routes into the United Kingdom were closed. So he doesn't know that in 2020, the only way to enter the United Kingdom to claim asylum legally was closed. He doesn't know that. And that's why the boats came. It's not a coincidence that the routes into the UK were closed in 2020, 2021, and then the boats started. Cast your minds back. I don't think you remember news stories about boats before then. But he doesn't know that. He thinks that uh, the United Kingdom takes everybody and that people like me, uh, you know, professional enablers, of, as we've been advised by the Home Secretary, want more boats. We're chasing a gravy train. We, uh, you know, this is some sort of conspiracy. Uh, he doesn't know that the United Kingdom takes less than 1% of the world's refugees that were number 18 on the list of European countries taking refugees. He doesn't know that France takes two or three times as many. Germany takes five or six times as many. He doesn't know that. Uh, he doesn't understand or, or he's not told uh, many of these things. And I think that's the problem. He, what he's told instead is the United Kingdom could take 100 million people because everybody wants to come here. And it's a lie. But he doesn't know that. And I think that's why the public discourse uh, is so, uh, so important. Um, and in terms of what other countries do, I mean, I think that's an excellent question. As I said, many other countries take far more uh, asylum seekers and refugees than we do. Germany is a perfect example of that. Uh, many other countries have lots of different safe and legal routes into the UK, uh, into their country for uh, refugees. Uh, the United Kingdom does not. The UK Home Office did uh, a commendable thing with the Ukraine scheme, and it has a commendable scheme as well on Hong Kong. But that's it. We have an Afghan scheme that last year took 22 people. The other resettlement schemes take something in the range of 200 to 400 a year. Uh, if you are fleeing persecution in Uganda because you are gay and you have a brother here, you cannot come here. Uh, that these are, you know, this is one of the key issues, and that is a, a, an alternative to what we have right now. Uh, surely, surely the alternative is to open up safe and legal routes, uh, recognise that for the people that we do have safe and legal routes, they're not on a boat. There's no Ukrainians or Hong Kongers on the boats. Uh, uh, you know, no one's saying we take everybody. That gentleman potentially thinks that we are saying that. No, I don't think anyone in this room would agree with that, but it's about doing your fair share. And simply saying no, pointing at something and saying no, no more, is demonstrated time and time again to not work. 
Uh, and the fact that we keep doing it in this cycle <laughs> uh, is frankly astonishing that we're still here. You know, we can look around to different European countries. Right? They're not perfect either. I'm not going to sit here and say that. But there are definitely alternative models that can be used and we should look at more carefully. Um, any thoughts on examples elsewhere in the world that work well? well? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to try and turn the question a little bit. Uh, that, I mean, I think we should not look at this through only or mainly comparative states. We should look at this within. So within the UK context, there are some really outstanding examples. We're sitting with a panellist, Pinna, that leads the work in Mary Hill Integration Network, where the local is often where the work, the good work can be done, as opposed to the states, because often at the state level, um, that's, that's where, you know, some of the kind of the, the, the toxic politics can start to frame the debates around migration, including within that, particularly recently, refugees. And we're seeing, you know, we are seeing the rise of overtly fascist, overtly fascist leaderships and voices and also governments within the, the state level. But a point that Cam touched on as well is about, in, or I think it was in the, the, it was in the perhaps elsewhere around, you know, in whose name is this approach and then this legislation been taken? And there's a gap, I think, between the, you know, the people who are perpetrating the legislation and in whose interests this type of legislation and this type of restrictive approach to refugees and migration is in. And then there's other people who are basically being silenced or having words put into their mouths or having their sentence finished for them, who actually don't want this type of approach. And maybe the Rwanda policy and what that actually means is, is, is kind of like starting to reveal some of, 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 of those tensions that the legislation and approach isn't their name. But I think we should consider looking at local areas as well about bringing people together. It's not a solution, but it, it's just a kind of a comment to try and balance out that we shouldn't only look at comparative states, we should also look at what can be done locally in terms of making people feel welcome and making people feel uh, able to deal with the often the pretty uh, systemically restrictive right, uh, impact on, and restrictions on people's rights. And the UK asylum system is one of many that have that. I really appreciate that, that insight, and, I, and I, I think it leads us on neatly to um, a point I really wanted to raise with Pinar. Um, one of the experiences I've had, certainly, as an MP and MSP, has been young people, constituents of mine, coming along heartbroken because they've went through school and then they want, you know, they've got great qualifications and they really wanted to go on and study at university, but then suddenly found, because of some obscure restrictions, they didn't qualify for student support, um, and therefore, were, you know, the, the, this opportunity that was tantalisingly close was snatched away from them. And I think that had a big psychological effect on a lot of young people that I represented. Um, PNR, I was really, you know, heartened to see the, 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 the you know, the grades not visas campaign, uh, and that was a particular example. I think just it, it, Graham highlights some innovations that have been happening. Perhaps you could tell us a bit more about that campaign. One of the things I feel like we've been hearing throughout the panel is how restricted the immigration system is. So maybe we can call it the restricted system, um, as it takes away people's right at, um, at so many various levels through, through one's journey. Um, so while someone is seeking asylum and while they're navigating the process, um, they are not allowed to study full-time courses at colleges, uh, and they are not allowed to um, study at the university level as well, as they will be treated as, a, um, as an international student. Um, and one of the things that we have seen over the many years is um, we have young people who are children of people seeking asylum, so people who are seven, six, 15, 16, 17 year olds, and they set their exams um, and then they get the qualifications to attend either a full time course at the college or at the university. Um, however, they are not able to do that um, as they will be treated as an international student. And then we also have people who are seeking asylum who do go to colleges um, uh, who are only allowed to start, uh, study part-time courses, then once they get their grades, they are not also allowed to study at the university level as well. Um, and this was an area that we have seen over the many years, um, and it had a huge impact on, on people's um, journey to continue their life so that they can 
take that next step to go to education, to further their education. Um, and um, I think that was last year or two years ago, we had um, one of our, a young student called Ahmed who came um, to men and we had a discussion about how he had his grades and he, when he applied to university, he was um, refused, unfortunately, based on his uh, immigration status. Um, and we decided to start a campaign called Our Grades Not Visas. And one of the uh, best aspects of the campaign was at the same time there was a legal case um, by, led by Just Right Scotland, by Andy and uh, by Ola, who's, who was in a similar situation as Ahmed, um, who took a legal um, action um, as um, the, the students' uh, right to education was violated, which Andy can talk about more. Um, and we've managed to raise awareness about the ongoing issues to see who, how many people is impacting this, um, whether that's young people or people who are in the asylum process wanting to attend hi higher education. Um, and as a result uh, of the campaign, as well as the hugely by the legal action, the Scottish government had to put through a consultation um, to gather uh, information about what could be changed. Um, uh, as they've, uh, they've had to, it was found out that they violated um, Ola's rights to education. Um, so as a result of this now, uh, children of people seeking asylum can go to university. Um, also unaccompanied uh, children can also go to university. And we still want to continue to find uh, and discuss about other possibilities of how to extend this to people seeking asylum as well. Um, at the moment, there are some scholarships, uh, which is called the sanctuary scholarships. Um, each university decides how many they are uh, providing this to. Um, and this is for uh, people seeking asylum. Um, so, for example, maybe the Glasgow University has 20 or 30, and uh, Strathclyde has um, X, X number of um, scholarships provided. However, we, feel, we still feel that this still puts a barrier for people to um, attend higher education as it it's still is a competition process where people have to apply for the scholarship and if you are lucky then you get placed in the university. Um, so that was, um, that was a huge successful campaign and maybe, I'm, sorry, I'm going to pass it to Andy so Andy can talk about it. I think yeah. it's an interesting example where, you know, there's reserve policies in relation to immigration asylum but there's also devolved competences where there are significant interventions that can be made that improve quality of life. And perhaps you'd like to tell us more about the legal process of how you achieved this um, change in the law. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is a good news story. It's nice talking about one of those. <laughs> um, yeah, we, th this is a story about um, how you can pull levers in Scotland that are devolved, so within the powers of, of the Scottish Parliament, to try and improve the lives of people, even though Westminster controls the situation with their immigration status. So it's about like, doing things here that make life better here, even though it's different to their immigration status. And it's also a good example, I think, of a legal organisation and a community organisation working hand in glove to try and bring about some change uh, off the back of um, what has been a, a long-standing issue for uh, the community. So we, um, you know, when you think about the term international student, right, you'll probably think, you know, a student coming from America or Canada or India or, or whatever in the world, Australia, coming to study here and do a master's or something. But the rules that we had here actually in Scotland uh, were that even if you lived here as a young person, even if you came here as a young child and grew up here and, and had legal status the whole time, when you came to apply to go to university, you were still treated, in most cases, as an international student. So we represented a young uh, woman called Ola, who arrived here just, just before her 11th birthday, right? went through her entire secondary school here, had legal status the whole time. Um, and when she applied to go to uh, study medicine at Dundee, you know, she wants to be a doctor, for goodness sake. We need <laughs> as many of them as we can get. Uh, she was told, no, you need to have lived here for seven years and you've lived here for six years, ten months, right? You're 58 days short. So we said, oh, come on, come on. Can you just wave the, forget about the 58 days? And the government said, no, we cannot do this. We were actually, we were working with a separate young person who grew up in care here. He wanted to be an engineer for the RAF, applied for a course 
He was uh, 20 years old when he applied. He'd lived here for, he, so he needed to have lived here for 10 years and he'd lived here for nine years, 10 months. And he was similarly told, no, you cannot get funding to go. You are an international student. A young person that was raised literally by the Scottish state. Uh, extraordinary. So yeah, we took a case to the court of session here in Edinburgh uh, saying this is not fair. This is a violation of their right to education. Uh, you know, charging them 50,000 a year for somebody who's effectively a Scot uh, is ridiculous and it's discriminatory. Uh, and <laughs> the Scottish Government, I have to say, defended it until the end, uh, but they lost. And the upshot of that is that because of the way human rights law works in this country is that when you lose a case like that in Scotland, the law just gets ripped up. And the court says, I'm not going to tell you what to do next, but you need to rip up the law and start again. And that was an example for me, in a way, of uh, kicking down the door, basically, and working with the campaign to say, well, you know, don't listen to lawyers like me. I have no experience of the issue. I'm not best placed to talk about this. But this community group and Ahmed and Ola and the young people actually affected are. So uh, walk on through the door, listen to them and, uh, you know, change. And the upshot of that is that the Scottish Government not only did it, to its credit, not only did it change the rules, reducing the timescales, you know, you just need to have lived here, have a visa and lived here in the UK for three years and live in Scotland. So much, much better now. Uh, but also they extended it beyond that to asylum-seeking children and the children, uh, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children and the children of asylum-seekers as well. So they went beyond actually what they needed to, and that's a direct result of the campaigning that was being done in the uh, Our Grades Not Visas campaign. So it's a good news story of where it, that nasty word human rights law can be used for good, community work can be used for good, and we are improving the lives of people who live here. And the, the, the economic downside is that we get more engineers and more doctors and more, you know, it, it, there's only upside. Uh, in terms of the, the, the small amount of money that, that it costs, uh, both upside to our economy, upside to our community, upside to our society. So it's a good news story. Karen, can you tell us a bit more about, like, sometimes I feel that these debates can often get caught in the horns of binaries, particularly in constitutional debates about where power should sit, devolved versus reserved, and sometimes, you know, we don't often focus on what we can do practically to help people now. Um, do you feel that we need to do more in Scotland to sort of really hold ourselves to account much more in the public sphere uh, around practical interventions we can do to make things better? Sure, and that's a really concrete example. And I think it's maybe just worth saying, and probably I should have said this in the, the kind of opening remarks, but we're talking very much here about people in the asylum system, and that when we're at a, a an event which is about navigating migration, it's just important to remember that that is a minority group that's disproportionately affected by, these, by the hostile environment. So um, I suppose that the, sort of the, the largely unseen way that migration is operating and working in our society is just important to remember as well. Um, and maybe just thinking about um, uh, learning from that, I suppose, and, and thinking about the ways in which we can we can we can make things easier for everybody in the migration system. Um, so it's 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 about education. There's other areas where we can we can really look at that in terms of things like housing. So the ferret's done quite a lot of of work around um, asylum housing for for really quite a long time, I suppose. And you see the way that um, uh, I do a lot of work well, writing as well about homelessness and homelessness that's uh, for people who are coming through a, a non-migration route. Um, and it's not great for them either, you know. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of writing about, uh, you know, really bad conditions, um, local authorities that are breaking their own very good legislation. Um, but what they do have is they do have better rights. And so I think that particularly comes down for children and young people. So, you know, we have really good, um, you know, rights around Scottish children and young people only being in bed and breakfasts for seven days, after which point you can involve a lawyer, you can get them moved out of, of, of that housing um, under Scottish housing law. Um, now, that is not true, obviously, for the children of asylum-seeking families um, who are spending long periods of time in really unsuitable accommodation in overcrowded hotel rooms um, with often, you know, 
people who've been through really traumatic events, um, people who don't have all the support systems that you might have in place as a Scottish family. That's a, a really a very, very difficult situation. Not getting access to school, often long waits because of things like not having a permanent address. So, you know, we've, we've covered children that have been out of school for, for months on end, which, you know, you can imagine as a parent is an incredibly stressful thing, just through bureaucracy, really. Um, and these are the kind of things that, that we could again get involved in, education, housing, thinking about how we create some kind of um, better citizenship rights for people that are right here in Scotland just now. Are there any particular cases that you've came across that struck you as particularly you know, difficult? I mean, one the case I think we did meet around was a couple of teenage boys were living in a bed and breakfast in Greenock and their parents and their younger brother were in Musselburgh. Uh, and the younger brother had a disability, but was stuck in a hotel room with no lift access, for example, and they weren't, weren't able to visit them properly, they couldn't go into the hotel, and they were street begging to fund the train tickets to get to Edinburgh to go and see their, their parents. It just felt like a particularly horrific example to me of how this works in the most egregious manner. Absolutely, and there's lots of different cases like that, I suppose, where you know you see people in just really harsh um, situations where you know families are, are are not getting to spend time together, where people who are really too young, like these boys, I think were were, were 16, um, so you know should not have been apart from parents and disabled brother, not able to visit properly. That particular family were in housing, um, I think, very kind of isolated housing. It's very difficult to reach by public transport and the housing was not suitable for the for the disabled um, child or young person either. Um, I think there's also, you know, Andy talked about um, people being scared and therefore angry. I think there's a reality that we're facing just now, which is, um, I talked before about those essential truths at the heart of moral panics. And, you know, we're, we're living through the incredible times of austerity and lack of resource. So housing, you know, is in this really short supply and everyone is trying to get more good social housing and that's what we desperately need. And so because we've got this um, real shortage of resources, you see local authorities making decisions that are really um, pretty horrendous for, for people um, at all stages of, of, of the process, but particularly at that sharp end of um, people with no recourse to public funds or people coming through insecure migration routes. And so you see, you know, kind of uh, single mothers being, you know, denied accommodation or having to fight for accommodation with their child um, and that being a really difficult bar to get through at times. Um, and that threat hanging over you, whether implicit or explicit around, you know, uh, the potential kind of involvement of the care system in those type of, of situations. Um, so, yeah, I think some of those cases stick with me particularly. Do you feel it resonates with the public to tell the human story? Um, you know, we can have a macro debate about the economics of migration and so on. Maybe that doesn't, you know, there's a cost, there's, there's that kind of argument about this cost as is, is a parasitic thing uh, versus, you know, it's adding to the economy but also the, telling those human stories of the realities that the, you know, of, a, of one family's experience or one person's experience can often hit home much more re strongly in the public consciousness. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I, I live quite near Kenmuir Street where there was the um, uh, real kind of groundswell of, of kind of the community coming together, um, both kind of, you know, people that were involved in, in campaigning around Salem Street, but just also ordinary people who lived in Pollock Shields in Glasgow when there was a home, uh, an immigration raid on, on, on two men. And, you know, it was incredible to be there and just feel that groundswell of people who knew their neighbours who knew these two men, who knew them as living on the second floor of the flat in Kenmuir Street. And that personal connection was what I think really drove that, that whole kind of event. And, and I think most people in this panel were there. But um, when people can connect with someone else, another human being, and see what their life is like, I think they always do want to help and do want to understand. And so that's why having people on barges, having people in hotel accommodation that's actually just institutional accommodation. It's not really functioning and it's a hotel like you or I, or, you know, a tourist would experience a hotel. Um, we divide people and we stop them from seeing those human stories. And so um, I think that is really the kind of thing that we need to put back is those 
um, human relationships and, and people having the opportunity to just express their humanity um, and, and see the, the similarities instead of this constant push to, um, to, to expose some kind of fault line or, or difference between people. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes to go in the panel discussion. Um, and I really want to bring it into this point about, you know, we've got no recourse to public funds for people subject to immigration control. We have, you know, this restriction on the right to work um, for people under immigration control. Um, yet a debate about how much it costs the public. So I just wondered whether, you know, what, what work um, are we doing in Scotland, Graham, to sort of talk about the economic opportunity uh, that we're missing? Uh, I mean just following on particularly from what Karen was saying, is if, if you look at kind of UK policy uh, on refugees, and not only refugees, because no recourse to public funds is broader than just refugees, it is all about separation. And actually it's moving to more about a segregation regime. Uh, and, it's all, and at its kind of like maybe from our perspective, rotten core, is they just don't want that human contact. And they want to really visualise the separateness and the otherness of people, and it's just another one of those racist techniques that we've, we've known about for, for decades and centuries, is that you separate and you other, uh, and then you start that process of dehumanising. And we're seeing it very nakedly, I think, at the moment, starkly, within the UK government under the, the Conservative Party at the moment. So, um, so in terms of human rights defenders, in terms of, of people who are just concerned, they don't want grandiose terms like human rights defenders apply to them, just concerned about what's happened to their pal or the person they see in the shop or the person they see near the school gates. That, you know, just trying to really articulate the, the need and the naturalness of people just coming together and living. And that's why people being in communities is so very important from, a, from us, from a human rights perspective, is that we want to see people together within communities because we know, and the evidence tells us that, the social scientific evidence particularly says, you know, that that does mean that the barriers don't actually come up in the first place, or if they do, they, they dissipate. So I suppose just to kind of say that point first, and that's why the work that, you know, organisations like Pinar does is, and the integration network is so important, just the concept of that, the concept of grand, it's a pretentious term, but just the idea of that, of people just coming together, eh, is such a simple but powerful one, and it's exactly what you won't see from the right, especially the kind of like the far right, they, they don't want that, they want to kind of like, eh, kind of like pedal in the idea of the other. In terms of, of Scotland, I mean, I just wanted to say a few things about, about Scotland, because I think we've got this, in refugee policy, a decent, uh, but I would say quite shallow, political consensus in relation to refugee rights. Now, I'm here from Scottish Refugee Council, and we're one of the participants within the refugee integration strategy. It's, it's very well regarded, the refugee integration strategy. It's called New Scots. Uh, I say shallow because actually on areas of asylum, it doesn't mean anything to people. It's my experience working in asylum for 10 years in Scotland. It doesn't cut through to them. Uh, people appreciate letters being sent by Scottish ministers critiquing UK government policy, but they don't, in my experience, see follow through of practical action to assist people. What they do often is we see people, and I keep saying Pinner, I'm not, but it's just because Pinner's an outstanding example of somebody that just takes responsibility that the, the state should be taking. In the Scottish context, the Scottish state should be taking. The example, the, the brilliant work that Andy and Pinner have done are grades not visas. As Andy said, the Scottish government fought that tooth and nail to the end. I experienced that in a previous life in the Human Traffic and Exploitation Act we now have, when. I worked with Jenny Mara, MSP, and we, we drafted the Private Members Bill for a, Scotland to have its own Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act. And we tried to get the Scottish Government to take that on, and they didn't take it on, and then we put it through the, this place, the Scottish Parliament, got the requisite, sufficient cross-party support. And then there was no choice. The Scottish Government either had to let Jenny Mara run with that legislation, and it would have passed, or the, to their credit, the Scottish Government took it on, and that's now what we've got the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act. So what I'm trying to say is that we need, and I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately trying to jolt here, I'm deliberately trying to jolt, I know this is on Scottish Parliament TV, is to say in Scotland, in the context of the Illegal Migration Act, which abolishes, as Andy says, the right to asylum 
for most people who need it, as well as even more sickeningly, uh, or as sickeningly, it abolishes the right of trafficking survivors, exploitation survivors, to access their support rights, including within our Scottish legislation. We need a commensurate response from the Scottish Government to the gravity of those rights violations. And the new Scots Refugee Integration Strategy cannot do that, because that was premised on a pre-Illegal Migration Act time. We're no longer in that time. The right to asylum has been effectively abolished. The right to be free of trafficked exploitation is effectively abolished as well, unless there's challenges taken to deal with those issues. Now, I know that doesn't deal with economic points, Paul, uh, but I was aware of time, and I just wanted to get that across, that you know, this is a public event. This is about people, I'm guessing, you know, varying levels of interest around refugees and migration issues. But going back before that guy interrupted his early doors in this, this session, it was like one of the points I was trying to say is the gravity of the change that we're now witnessing. And I'm not going to be feeling the effects of that, but there's people out there who are um, now, right now, feeling the effects of that. And you go, what is the effects? Well, that's somebody that's suffering severe forms of exploitation right now, who no longer can access those rights to support that as accommodation, legal assistance, counselling, you know, things that any decent human being would go, you're in a situation of exploitation, let's get you out of that situation of exploitation and let's start trying to work with you so that you can start to have a bit of control and safety again in your lives. This is what we're talking about. So I know that doesn't answer your question, but I just want to convey the gravity of the change that we've got and, and therefore the need for us all in this room, as much as we can within our different ways, to really push for substantive work in Scotland against this, because otherwise we're going to have severe forms of exploitation ripping through more of our communities, because the asylum system and the trafficking system are otherwise been shut down by currently Swella Bravham and, and the Home Office, and we can't let that happen just like that. I mean, these, these rights have been too hard won over the years. Well, you answered a better question, so I'll let you off. So, uh, I want to just quickly touch on, you know, I, I don't know if Pina was hit a beamer there with the amount of compliments she was getting there, but, but, uh, but what I would say is, you know, there's practical examples of intervention. The Parliament has a role, not just, you know, to be a, a sort of echo chamber, it's got to hold government to account to its responsibilities. Um, you know, we've touched on the, gre the Grades Not Visas campaign. Um, another example identified by members of the Mayoral Integration Network in Glasgow was transportation as a means of integration. Uh, you know, the nature in which the segregation is happening quite insidiously, um, but also the economics of rent pressures pushing people to the poorest accommodation in the city, often in the outskirts, means spatially uh, in places like Glasgow, hard to get around, hard to access services, hard to communicate and socially interact. Um, yet the NRPF, no recourse to public funds, means no access to social security, lack of access to work means effective enforced poverty of a of, of extreme degree. Um, the stipend which refugees uh, have, uh, sorry, asylum seekers have is approximately four pounds, five pounds a day when it works out. So a bus fare for the day wipes out your daily allowance, you know, so it effectively means total destitution or paralysis socially, uh, physically. Um, Pinar, can you tell us a bit more about the campaign around, you know, navigating through the icebergs of the no recourse to public funds restrictions to try and find practical interventions such as extending the concessional travel scheme in Scotland? Um, I think one of the things that Graham also mentioned was the number of people who are seeking asylum and refuge in the UK and in Scotland. And when we put that into context, um, at, the moment, at the moment there are about 5,000 people who are seeking asylum in, in Scotland. Um, and out of this 5,000 people, obviously there are children who are already um, um, getting support from the under-22 uh, bus passes. Um, so when we're talking about the number of people who are in Scotland who are struggling and who are, I would say, at the extreme level of poverty below any other sections on, in our communities, dependent on the Home Office support of asylum support, which is £45 a week, um, where you are not allowed to work. So if you're a skilled person or if you have a profession, your profession is just being wasted over the years um, and you're not able to contribute to the society, pay your taxes, pay your rent and just 
you know, live as normal um, a life as a other citizen in the country. Um, and now with the hotel accommodations, when somebody is in a hotel in, um, across the country, they are giving £9 a week. So this £9 is meant to cover all aspects of your life, including travel, buying essential items like a simple thing as a shoe, or getting a scarf for the winter, which is all year through in Scotland. So um, you are expected to live on this uh, amount that you're given. And then if you are lucky that you're near a, a sports group or near a charity group, then you're able to go and connect with people in there. And one of the things that is, it has been coming up over the years is the, the connections people make throughout the city and across the country and how difficult it is to travel um, when you are giving limited number of uh, amount of support. Um, so we've joined the campaign together with the Voices Network and with Min Voices asking for the extension to have free bus travel for people seeking asylum in Scotland. Um, and we've been having meetings with the transport uh, minister um, and we are hoping to meet with the new transport minister um, as well. And we've been speaking with, the trans with Transport Scotland as well. And one of the things that we found that out is we know that immigration is a reserved matter. However, transport is a devolved matter and it's an area that could be explored. Um, and we feel the long term impact for people to connect um, and have access to their rights, such as if they are placed in Falkirk. We have friends in the room from FOSS in here. Um, let's say if they have, uh, if they are in hotel in Falkirk, but their lawyers are in Glasgow, they have to travel um, to Glasgow to have an appointment to meet their lawyer. Um, that is just simply not going to work for them to travel. Um, if there was a meeting, let's say twice a week, it's just simply not going to happen. And I don't think it is, it is fair for um, other organisations um, to fulfil the role of the government and to fulfil the role of local authorities. Um, so we hope that with, with this campaign, and now it's been over one year, and we have been slightly disappointed with the process of the campaign. Um, we, feel, we feel that the need is very clear, the ask is there, and the impact on people's well-being and people's um, connection would be uh, is very well evidenced um, and we do hope that we can take this further where um, it would become a um, reality at least um, in this restricted system that people are navigating through they will have some freedom to travel and to get be connected and have access to certain um, certain areas uh, within their life whether that's to access in justice in terms of meeting their uh, lawyers or uh, attending um, education, such as going to college or to ESO classes, or simply just meeting with a friend, just to um, walk. Um, again, if you were to go for a coffee, you won't be able to go for a coffee because um, that nine pound is so precious that you would want to keep to buy your travel or any other means. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. And, um... I think just on that point of no recourse to public funds, just to kind of finish up, it, it does have a chilling effect on the civil service, on ministers, and their understanding of their freedom of action. Um, and you know, you've given some greater clarity on that, but do you still feel it's a big sticking point about the frontier of reserved and devolved competence than that we often are reluctant to, to move as boldly as we could in Scotland in terms of measures such as the under 22s scheme extension to all asylum seekers? Yeah, I think fundamentally when it comes to combating the effects of no recourse to public funds, in my experience we see two broad um, difficulties, I would say. The first one is at the national level uh, and it is what I perceive to be you know, a concern and to some extent justified given history, is that when you take steps to implement something, so if the Scottish uh, government was to introduce a particular fund, a discretionary fund to help asylum seekers. There's a concern that the Home Office see it and say, aha, we've seen this and we're going to put that on the list for no recourse to public funds as well. So you can't have that. So they add it to the list that means people can't get it. And that has happened in the past. And we see other uh, examples of this happening elsewhere in the UK, in Wales, they introduced 
a uh, minimum income for care experienced young people, so all care experienced young people. And the Home Office jumped up and down about it because it was going to be given to unaccompanied asylum seeking children. And actually, in the end, uh, it, it was the amount of money those kids received brought them out of the scope of legal aid. Right? So, they couldn't, uh, so they couldn't get legal aid to see their lawyer for their asylum claim, unaccompanied children. And so the Welsh Government said to the, the Ministry of Justice, you know, can you just create a wee carve out here for these kids because you know they need to see their lawyers for their asylum claim? And the Ministry of Justice said no. So the Welsh Government had to actually take away the, the, the minimum income for those kids. So that's a good example of where there's just intergovernmental chaos. You know, <laughs> politically controversial, not, shouldn't be a politically controversial statement, but you know, we are at this moment in time all one country, and how are we supposed to legislate? How are lawmakers supposed to be doing their jobs when the two governments are like this? And, and you know, I'm not uh, necessarily blaming the Scottish government because that is you know, a, a consequence of a really nefarious policy-making agenda. Uh, in, in London, but it's problematic, right? The second uh, problem that we see, and this is one that's on the ground, is a really poor understanding of what no recourse to public funds actually means, right? No recourse to public funds is literally a list, right? And it's written down, and it's, you know, housing benefit, GSA, uh, in universal credit. But if it isn't on the list, then it's not a public fund, and people can access it. But the problem is, there's a lot of what we call gatekeeping in statutory authorities and in other institutions where they think public fund just means everything that could possibly come from the public, but it's not. So we get sometimes local authorities saying, oh, well, we can't provide support to this child or, and this family because it's a public fund, we're social work. And I say, well, no, it's not, it's not on the list. We can't give them educational funding because it's a public fund. No, it's not, it's not on the list. We can't, can they get legal aid? Uh, well, yes, because it's not on the list. Uh, and there's a lot of that. So, you know, it's fine me saying that as a lawyer, but the person needs to get in front of me in order to understand that. And the, and the, the, the gatekeepers, I think a lot of them are just mistaken and it's accidental. Uh, some of them, I suspect, not so much and are just relying on you not getting in front of a PNR or, or somebody like me. Uh, which is difficult, right? Uh, and so, you know, we spend a lot of our time trying to educate professionals and statutory services around what this actually means, <laughs> because uh, it's actually not that complicated. <laughs> is it on the list? No? Well, they can access it. Here endeth the lesson. On that revelatory point <laughs> about NRPF, uh, I just want to, it's now eight minutes past 12, so I want to not eat into our Q&A time any longer. And just to invite anyone from the room who has a, a question. As I see a gentleman's hand at the back. Is there anyone else? Please do wave your hand. So there's a few now. Right, so uh, hold your thoughts and we'll come back to you all. But just that's great to have an interest. So we'll start with the gentleman at the back. And then there's a lady down the front as well. Uh, a couple of ladies here. And, and then we'll continue. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Robertson. I have a question for the panel. And that is, why don't these, say, uh, hordes of immigrant invaders stay in Italy and France? Why do they all want to come to Britain? Is it that we're a soft touch? Okay. Um, so that's an interesting point that's raised quite frequently about uh, why do people migrating or, or seeking asylum not seek refuge in the first geographical safe territory that they encounter? Um, maybe, Graham, you could ask, answer that point. Yeah, yeah, no. It's, 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 as Paul said, it's, it's a really common question. And, I mean, it's an understandable question. Um, I'm from Scottish Refugee Council. We talk to people who don't agree with what we say. Uh, I suppose the first thing is just to say that it's, a fact, it's just a factual point that most people the world, in the world's refugees, and in particularly rich parts of the world, but like Europe, uh, don't come to the UK. It's a, it's, it's a relatively small number. So it's, and, that, and the stats bear that out. You know, we're not going to make a value judgment. Otherwise, it's just that. But I suppose this is where I would want to go into maybe more the kind of the psychological part here about why people move. So if you're somebody who's came from Afghanistan or you've came through Eritrea, through Libya, 
Uh, you probably fleeing pretty serious stuff in terms of your, your right to life, your ability to survive. You've maybe witnessed some horrendous atrocities. Um, you're going to be going through pretty grinding separation from everything that you've been familiar with. So, in, in other words, in a, in a, in a, I suppose I'm not being this godly, it's a big deal, right? It's a big deal, you know, and I think it's important for us as people here in a relatively stable part of the world just to not, you know, not kind of like hurt ourselves but with, with, with going overboard and empathising, but been recognising that we've I can't obviously speak, and I wouldn't speak for everybody in this room, that would be completely inappropriate, but we haven't had to do that generally in Scotland. We haven't had to make that perilous survival decision. So that's kind of a human level. Uh, people have to get out of really bad situations. Uh, I suppose the second bit, is, and this is one of the reasons we think the Refugee Convention has been such a successful life-saving instrument, a law over the last 70 to 80 years, is if I, I, again, I can only speak for myself, but if I had to get out of a, a situation, uh, my home, maybe I've lost some of my family or they're in danger, I don't just want to go somewhere and just sit there, which is what actually what most of the world's refugees do, is sit in a camp. And, you know, and that's my life, because I only get one life, that's my life, I'm just sitting in a camp. And I've got to, I've got to just park my life. If I've got children, part my children? No, of course I'm not. What human being is going to do that? They're not wanting to, and they shouldn't be expected to do that. People have lives, people have values, human beings, regardless of whether they're refugees or whatever their background is. That, to me, that's what human rights mean, sir. But it is. So the most human, relatable thing to do is not only to get out of the danger, but then to move somewhere where you feel you can build a life. So then you go into, OK, where am I going to be able to build a life? Well, if I have the language, that, or I've got a bit of the language, in this case, English, then, then yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good reason. If I've got a pal that I used to go to school with, or from a local area, that's another really human, relatable reason that I can certainly associate and relate to. If I feel that there's going to be an ability for me, if I've got a professional background, which many refugees do, that I can actually further my own, get back to this thing about building a new life, that second often forgotten part of what being a refugee is, uh, then I'm going to do that. Now, for the vast majority of the world's refugees, as I said in my opening remarks, that isn't. They don't come to the UK. It's a very small, small proportion. It's like 0. I think it's 1% basically of the world's refugees, asylum seekers, sorry, come to the UK. And proportionately, or compared to uh, other countries of equivalent size in Europe, it's, it's, very, it's, it's relatively small. So, I think there's very understandable... I suppose what I'm trying to say, sir, is like, it's an understandable question, but from our perspective, from my perspective, you know, we think it's the most human, relatable thing to do for people to want, if there's language, if there's family, if there's friends, if there's something that they feel they can build a new life, perhaps their professional skills, then that's, that's, that's something that I can get behind, because I think that person's got out of danger. And they've moved to somewhere which might not be the first safe country, but that other country might not be where they have the language or the friendships or the family or the or the where they feel they can be safe for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Oh, thanks for that. Um, so there's a couple more questions. Do you put your hands back up if you're wanting them to? Right, there's a couple of ladies here. And we'll, I think there's ladies. Why don't we do groups of three, and that means we can try and cr cram as many in as we can. So the lady just there, uh, and then we'll come down this side and do three and then we'll come over here <laughs> okay don't, don't worry uh, yep so i had two questions hopefully they won't be too complicated but my uh, my first question was uh, for graham you were talking about pe the local being a positive and i totally agree with you on that but with the new um legislation should we be expecting that people will reach that point because what happens to someone when they arrive, say, in Calais? Are they going to come to a hotel that, like I, where I work in Falkirk? Or are they going to be put into detention from that point? That yeah, yeah, uh, you got another question you wanted to quit? The question was, um, I don't know if Pinar or anyone else on the panel has any examples, because I'm seeing people leaving asylum accommodation and then going into homelessness accommodation. I'm wondering if there are any examples of positive pathways to housing because obviously the the 
council housing pathways are failing just now for various reasons. And I don't know if there are any organisations helping people into stable housing, which will then allow them to apply for jobs and move on with their lives accordingly. Let's hold those thoughts. And we're just going to lead it here. And then I think you had the question as well. So we'll just do you guys and then we'll come back to the panel. OK. Sorry, my name is Sophie Taylor. I'm not going to ask a question on a locality. I was interested in the business case. I was listening to a professor from Finland looking at Ge uh, uh, geographical across Europe, including the UK, and the decrease in birth rate. They say, she says that in 2026, it will become very obvious that we are unable to sustain uh, our economy because of that. And that looking at migration as an answer to this process. The question was actually based on the issue of only two working individuals is supporting every pensioner in the United Kingdom. We have Brexit as a problem. We have a massive shortage of uh, people who, are, who can work. And I don't actually quite understand why this government is still hanging on this to this process to stop asylum seekers trying to find work, which have the skill, the ability, and the opportunity to enrich this country. And I don't understand. There's a business case in this. And I don't understand why this government isn't going down that avenue. Expressing your, your view, that was a really good view um, expressed well. Um, so the lady at the front here, uh, if, you, if you still want to ask a question, are you, are you happy? Okay, uh, is there anyone over here? Uh, take one, this lady at the end. She did want to ask, sorry, sorry, I misunderstood you, sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to you in a second, sorry. Uh, apologies. Uh, um, sorry. So my name is Anisha um, and I am the Equality and Human Rights Officer for AMNA in Glasgow, um, though we do support people all over Scotland. So the first thing I kind of wanted to talk about was, or to gauge an opinion on, was what you think about the current system, particularly down in England, um, where if a woman is in danger and, and needs to report something, i.e. domestic violence or anything like that, there's a barrier to them doing that because automatically, irrespective of the reason that the police have been phoned, they now have to report that there is an illegal immigration system and it, there is an immigrant in that house and they have to report it to the Home Office. So it's a barrier to them, again, accessing their human rights because for whatever reason, they need to phone the police to get some help. So I'd like to get an opinion on that and another question just for Andy was um, does the three-year limit apply um, for legal cases so in the civil system at the moment you've got to do things within three years if we've got people coming to us that actually haven't been able to gain any legal representation for three four years can they still use that service and, and do they still get a chance okay um so we had questions, I think we had the question to Pinar, first of all, from the lady at the top. Um, would you like to come back on that one? Yeah. yeah. Um, so regarding the housing, um, so what happens is when somebody um, is in the asylum process and then they get granted some form of a refugee status or some form of a leave to remain, um, we have partnered with the Scottish Refugee Council and we have an integration officer in our in our premises where we then uh, provide that service for the people to take the next step. Um, and usually that person has um, around 28 days to leave their accommodation provided by uh, mayors, who, who is the housing contract, uh, contractor from the Home Office. So they have to pro uh, leave their accommodation in 28 days and then they have to enrol into um, a system where they will be giving um, accommodation um, within the local uh, area or the local authority. Um, so this has been our experience where we work in partnerships so that people are guided with the right information and they have the option to choose which local authority um, that they should be going to and also they are giving the correct information in terms of what happens next. Um, because navigating the asylum process is very difficult, but once you get your status, then you have a new journey where you have to very quickly 
learn the system and be supported um, as well. So we work in partnership uh, with SRC in, in terms of that. But if you have any more questions, I'm happy to answer afterwards or maybe have a um, talk as well, yeah. Andy, would you be able to come back to the lady's point at the front, um, just about the, some of the issues there? Um, can, I, uh, can I ask you to clarify the question? The three-year limit, are you talking about the education uh, no, limit? So Oh, I see. Okay, and this is women who have experienced violence. Is that where no, we're, no? This, this, there's a range of issues, but at the end of the day, their, their human rights and something has been breached. I understand. Um, and legal representation is increasingly difficult. <laughs> it sure is, yeah. Uh, okay, so I think your question is about. Um, it's called it's called the prescriptive period. So, like, in order to litigate something, uh, the incident needs to have happened within a certain period of time. Um, for some cases, it's three months. Uh, for some cases, it's six months. For some cases, it's one year. For some cases, it's five. Um, in my experience, it can be it's a significant barrier of accessing justice. So, it, it, and we see it across our work actually. Uh, I was working with a disabled woman recently uh, who was experiencing some problems with her local authority. This is not a migration uh, case. And she was told to go through the complaints process in the council, and it took a year. And when, that came, when they came out and said, nah, uh, and we were at the point of she contacted us to litigate the case, you know, the time limit to bring the case expired after three months. So the complaints process just ran down the clock. Uh, and it's a really common experience. It will happen to all, all of you in this room if you do have interactions like that with, 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 the, stat, with the state. Um, so it, it is an issue. It's not, uh, it's not insurmountable, though. Uh, different cases have different time limits. Uh, and so it's really that specific, I would say. Um, my view is always, like, where there's a will, there's a way. So I think um, if you have anything specific, we can talk about it afterwards. Just in the interest of time, I just want to try and get some people in from this side of the room. So we've got two ladies at the back and, and a gentleman at the front. So there's three here. So we'll do this group of three and then we'll figure out who can come back on them. Uh, OK, that's great. Hello, um, my name is Phoebe Warren. I work in immigration law and I live in Glasgow. You're my MP, MSP, Paul. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to get a gauge from anyone who's willing. And if I'm able to, I'd love to ask Paul as well. Um, I, I know that we look at the government down south and 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 their their policies on migration and asylum and for for um, for better words they they've been awfully creative um, in their policy approaches but I, I as we get closer to the general election I'm becoming more nervous um, that there's a lack of creativity in policy approaches the opposite way. Um, and I was wondering just a gauge of how people are feeling on uh, migration and asylum policies as we get closer to immigration. And I'd be interested to hear from the Labour approach as well, particularly. Uh, and that's someone else. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, um, I'm Rachel and um, I do some stuff with Climate and Film Foundation. So um, I was just wondering, um, you were touching on the, um, the asylum seekers that are in um, hotels. Um, I'm sure most of you know about what's happening in Erskine right now with the, the hotel. We're seeing every Sunday more and more far-right groups um, like Patriotic Alternative. Um, do you think we are seeing a rise in far-right um, individuals um, protesting because of the governments or the media? If, if you could just expand on that. Gentlemen here. Yep. Hello, hello. Good afternoon. I am Ishmael from Min Voices. I just want to ask one, two questions. Firstly, is seeking asylum a right or a privilege? Secondly, what is the pulling factor has to do with all what is going on in the UK? The pulling and the push. What is the push factor? The push factor has to do with, with people in the UK. Are they not using asylum issues as a bait for 
showcasing the inadequacies of governance? That's my question. Oh, can I fit this together quite well, actually? So that's, uh, right, thanks for those. Um, so we have a sort of question around the coming general election, UK level, probably within the next year or so. What, what are the political dynamics of that um, in terms of immigration policy? Um, and obviously that ties into the gentleman's question there about, um, you know, it, is it being used to cover up for inadequacies in government? Um, I suppose there's a comms angle there. Maybe, Karen, if you had a view on, on some of that uh, about parties political positions and, you know, using immigration as a, as a pinata, I feel like, <laughs> or a lightning rod or something. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll let you pick up maybe more on the, the party political um, points that, that were raised at the back, but on, on some of the other factors around, you know, asylum as a right versus a privilege and whether, you know, that, that kind of is, you know, the, 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 the um, there's this sense that, you know, we don't talk about the push factors, that we don't talk about the, the human rights abuses, that we don't talk about about war, but we don't really talk about what's going on internationally that's causing this. And I think that was kind of just to bring it back to my point about it's a little bit like the prohibition on the drug war. You know, we don't talk about the reasons why, um, you know, people might be um, having problematic relationships with substances. We, we just talk about cracking down and being tough on crime. And, and that's basically like trying to trying to address a, a, a problem by 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 looking the wrong direction and it feels like that is absolutely the case here you know we're seeing cuts to the aids budget uh, the, to the international aid budget at a time when we desperately need to be much more engaged in um, the global realities that we're facing um, and we're just not doing that and a lot of the time you know if we're if we're looking over here at stopping small boats we're not actually looking at the wider picture of what's going on internationally and what we as a society both in scotland the uk as communities as individuals could be doing about addressing some of that so absolutely 100 percent we need to be thinking about those um those push factors and and you know just to go back to the to the the gentleman at the back's um, point about why people are not stopping in safe countries another thing that's come up to me a lot in interviews is people's heartbreak when they they grew up in a in a colony um, and in a country in which they were told that mother britain would take care of them in times of of, of crisis and so when they come here they actually were taught that in school and believed it and so to go into a situation in which you are um, stripped of all the rights that everybody around you has um, and you are struggling with your mental health I have people texting me telling me they're suicidal telling me they just can't take it anymore um, and that's the realities that people across the country are, are, are sitting here in Scotland right now facing um, you know, the devastation of that, of taking away that, that thing that you believed in as Britain, as this great country, you know, is, is, another, is another factor, I think, there. So uh, some of the rhetoric that's being, you know, around the rise of the far right that you mentioned, you know, we've done quite a lot of coverage of, of Patrick, alternative colleagues of mine at, at the Ferret, um, and, and that's, we've been charting that over quite a long time. And certainly I think that... Um, while it's still, I think, uh, a minority view in Scotland, there's much more visibility and there's much more um, uh, acceptance of it in, in, in the mainstream. And I think that is um, very much to do with some of the xenophobic language that we see coming out of um, you know, the mouths of our leaders. Um, you know, even this week, the, the, the kind of comments that, that had no pushback, that were you know, accepted um, and, and defended by members of the Conservative Party. So, um, I think it's, it's unleashed um, a, a, a sort of um, ability for that to be moving into the mainstream. And, you know, you'll see parties like Homeland and, and so on trying to get um, onto the ballot papers. So it's, it's definitely something that we need to be very alert to. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got 20 seconds left. So uh, on the point about uh, the political framings and the, the, the narrative, I think a large part of the problem we have in this country is the first past the post electoral system. I know this is not a seminar on electoral reform, but... I think a lot of what's going on and what ch drives behaviours in our political discourse is actually calculating the electoral system and where, it, where narratives play well in target constituencies. And I think that creates a big distorting effect on our national conversation. So without getting into the weeds of it, I think that's the, the underpinning issue I have. And that's why I support a change in the, the electoral system in the UK towards proportional, 
proportionality, because I think we'd have a more sane political discourse <laughs> generally. Uh, so without getting into that indulgent point uh, any further, I just want to say massive thank you to our panellists, uh, who I'm sure you'll agree have been very enlightening uh, today. So I just uh, would like to invite you to, to you know, give them a hand uh, to Graeme, Pinar, Karen and Andy. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention and your, your, your courteousness and the way in which you engaged in what are often quite challenging and contentious issues uh, and, and for being so understanding. Uh, so despite the interruption uh, unscheduled, um, I think we had a productive session uh, and if there's any further points you want to raise, I'm sure our panellists would happily chat to you afterwards. So thank you again for your time. Thank you and hope you enjoy the rest of the session.